This is a question about if, if this is the only religious reality that exists in the daily life of the children. It's all in the eye of the beholder, I think. Well, for instance, um, the interesting thing about being on the street and the children sleeping on the street, for instance, and we shot this film entirely on location, was the place where the children sleep uh, has behind them the icons. Uh, the wall is divided into four sections, which was painted by a street painter on another side of the street, but I had the same painter pr painted on this side, the exact same mural. And the mural is four gods, uh, Jesus Christ, Allah, um, Ganesh, I think it was, and I can't remember the fourth one. Uh, I think it might have been Buddha. Um, and that was a, you know, that is the reality, the daily reality of a kid on the street or a person on the street um, that actually symbols of spiritual things uh, and people and icons and religion are actually everywhere. There are shrines on every street corner practically, but the interesting thing about that shrine that I chose to duplicate was that it was a multi-reality and that ju they just coexisted side by side, whether it's Jesus or Ganesh or Buddha. So, uh, a part, partly it's a funny thing that these, these icons used to be painted also to prevent people from uh, pissing on the streets, you know, to p prevent people from, from keeping these walls as sacred as they could be. And that was also why children slept where the religious icons were, because that would be a clean place, that would be held sac sacrosanct. So actually, uh, the idea of a sacred place is absolutely part and parcel of daily life for a street child or anybody on the street. And it could be a religious symbol or a ceremony, like you see they pray to Ganesh. And Ganesh is a very beloved god because firstly, he's like a bit of a monkey god and he's beloved to children, but also because he represents the person who overcomes obstacles. So a big part of our my whole drive to raise the money in time was because I knew I wanted to start with the beloved birthday of Ganpati, which is this huge day in Bombay. Um, I remember when I showed this film after it finished at the DG in, in LA, I, I overheard people you know, thinking it was a $15 million film because they thought it was that I had paid for all those extras, but of course, uh, <laughs> they were all free and we just, we just, it was hidden camera and we put our crew in it. And uh, so I knew I had to begin filming on Ganpati, at least in order to, to get, capture that great celebration and the possibility of how Chai Pao and Rekha could get separated. So that is a huge symbol for India, for, uh, for Bombay specifically, but uh, other religious symbols just abound uh, like cheek by jowl on a daily, hourly basis, actually. So this viewer had a question about the scene when Baba meets the white report, the white female reporter and question about why he does what he does. This was um, 1980s, we shot this film, 87, and um, um, the, and we wanted to very much, uh, and, uh, you know, portray this person, Baba, who was a Mr. Fix-It, who sold three-in-one radios, who sold drugs on the side, who did a little of everything, who tamed new prostitutes, who, who was available for anything, you know, Mr. Fix-It. So number one, it was a way to uh, show him sort of showing off and to, for you to understand that he was that kind of Fix-It. And there was this huge fascination with foreign journalists coming in and both on the side of the journalists who wanted to come in and expose the red light air Area and all this sensational stuff which was all and there was also what I was interested in was the was the game that the Indians the, the locals played for the foreign journalists you know that they would put on a good show because they would make better copy you know and it was a very interesting to and fro and you, always the Baba character would be the smarter one you know so that was the idea of using that scene to show what Baba does and also that he shows off and loses it but particularly of course dramatically to humiliate Chilam and to have it be the signal of his demise and to see that uh, Chai Pao un is, is, is looking at this is seeing this and everybody is you know the, the Rekha and the, and the little Lamanju and the general the show that turns sour you know, that was the idea, to also the irrationality of Baba, that he can get arrogant one second and brutal the next. He flew off the handle and he wanted to show off and it turned wrong because she was put off by it and she left, so he looked bad, Baba looked bad, Chilam was miserable, Ch Chilam got the upper hand and Chai Pao and, and Manju witnessed everything. Yeah. So that allegiances w uh, were made f from that sort of debacle. Was it hard for you to find just the perfect boy to play Krishna? 
was it, I mean, to, was it a long process or, or did you have somebody in mind from the beginning? You know, in this workshop, which was, which was primarily to create, it was nothing to do with acting, this workshop. It was primarily to create a physical and mental discipline, it, it, concentration, because concentration is the key to film acting. Uh, you know, and especially for a street kid whose concentration is hardly there, you know, it's very, very important, you know, like any shot, you take any shot, the last shot, for instance, is a shot that um, is a very long take, and it's, uh, we, and always because we had really no money with this film, there was no more than two to three takes for any shot, and a lot of the shots were long takes, so, uh, that last shot, I remember we had stock for only three takes, and it was the la end of the film, and, and he is supposed to come in and sit down and, um, and then spin the top, and I knew that spinning the top would cost too much stock, because he, it may not spin on all of that, so we just had him wind the top as a symbol of that. This is the thing, the only thing he came with to the city, and at the end of his journey at this point in his life, that is the only thing that remains with him, is the same top. And so uh, I had him spin the top, I mean, uh, wind the top up and then sit there and cry like the little boy he is, and then to look up, to stop crying and to look up like he will never be a child again, because he essentially, of course, has murdered a man. So that was the shot. And, and the way we would do any shot in this film was to control the cr cr you know, crowds that range from any, any shot from 500 to 1,000 people. And so my uniform while shooting Salam Bombay was salwar kameez, uh, terrible sneakers, and a huge thick rope around my waist many, many times, and a megaphone that uh, hung from the, from the rope. And I would, you know, we would approach a location like that, that veranda where the chai pao had to sit, and I would just take one rope, one side of the rope, and give it to a, crowd, a person who was looking. And I would say, please hold this. And then I would turn around and charm the crowd a lot by going around and around and give the end to the other person at the end. And then I would say, please help us. Please look at us. Please be quiet. Please help us. I would just be like a politician, like, you know, <laughs> Indira Gandhi. Please, I am at your service. I am the dust under your feet. Enjoy yourself, but shut up, you know, <laughs> and, and stuff like that. And. And then the, the, the shot would be ready to be filmed. And then Chai Pao would come in and I would talk to him through that shot because it was such a complicated shot. And, and in the middle of the first take, which he was doing beautifully, and I would have not shot a second because stock was so rare, a person just from, from malice uh, above the veranda threw a flower pot directly in the center of the frame in front of his face, which crashed in the, on his feet. And obviously, the shot was gone. And uh, you know, the concentration of this boy was such that we had to do it again, and he did it. What you see is take two. And um, so anyway, so it was very clear in the workshop. You know, when we had the workshop, and in the fourth week of the workshop, we brought in the screenplay. And the kids were just divided into many groups, and they would, they would uh, improvise scenes from the screenplay. And we would constantly improve the scenes depending on what they could say or not say. But throughout this, obviously, I was observing who was who. And then finally, we had a screen test and brought in the camera, which was just a little video camera. And it was, uh, there was just no doubt and no, nothing uh, that stopped me from Krishna, from yeah, no, Sai Shafiq. Amazing. He's yeah. really amazing. Do you know he what happened to him afterwards or what? Of course I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, obviously everybody wants to know about him. He was actually 15 years old when he played this role. He played an 11 year old and I didn't even know he was that old, much older, 15 he was. Um, the age almost of my son and all his classmates who are here tonight. Um, and that is an age where you've pretty much found who you are. And, it, and w what he was then was a loner, uh, a kid of alcoholic parents who had left Bangalore, South India, where, his parent, where he was brought, came from, at the age of nine. So he was on the streets for solid six years. And unlike a number of the younger kids like Manju and uh, Insect, whom we call Kira, the guy who is, uh, you know, the little fellow, who, the littlest fellow, he has a fantastic story. He was adopted by our s director of photography, Sandy Sissel, who lived in Santa Monica, and he then became a boogie board champion in Santa Monica. <laughs> and, um, 
and then uh, works uh, as assistant in Panavision now and is married to a wonderful Chinese-American girl and just had a baby. So his life, <laughs> his life, I mean, you know, I, when I meet him, I just talk in Hindi to him and he answers me in American twang and I slap him a few times and <laughs> he still answers in American twang. So, but he's really a great kid, uh, not so kid anymore. But Shafiq, um, Shafiq uh, was, you know, much more cemented. He was not going to be changed in any easy way. Um, he made two, two three f uh, TV sh serials after this film, um, you know, sporadically, but is, uh, in, in immediately uh, became a light boy, like what they call a light boy, you know, assistant in a gaffer, uh, in a little studio, first in Delhi and then in Bombay, and always did things for about tops two years and then let them go and now and had a bit of a rough spot he stole some money he got into trouble and you know up and down like that and everybody wanted to know what he w was doing he had won the national award the biggest award in india for best uh, promising new actor so everybody knew him so he was in and out of like my not big trouble but mild trouble and finally he's just like an american child actor yeah <laughs> yeah well but american child actor but no parents no family no you know real but now I'm, uh, he has married well, he's g had two children, he lives in Bangalore where, with, where his family lives um, and he runs a scooter rickshaw business <laughs> after having burnt one on screen. Um, he has two rickshaws and he, you know, has that business, yeah. Has Mira ever na imagined what happened next to the characters, what the next scene would be? No, not really. I mean, not since making it, but we struggled a lot with the idea of what would be or should be the ending. I mean, we really didn't have a clear ending until we shot it, basically. The idea was to, you know, the key, the real difficulty of making an ensemble film is the spine, the dramatic spine of the film. And actually, we had so many stories of all these people, but what was going to keep you there, you know? And it was very late in the game, I think two weeks before shooting. Uh, we had the eighth draft that was the shooting script. It was two weeks before shooting. A funny thing, I had seen uh, long before that a uh, John Waters film which used odorama you know, polyester, I think it was. And it was an absurd thing I saw in upstate New York, months before shooting Salam Bombay, where it was so goofy and they, they used to emit these noises on, on screen and they had this flash card and you had, to, you, had, you had a scratch card, the audience card, and you scratched it and the number of the thing was on the upper right-hand corner and that was the sign to tell the audience to scratch that and then you'd smell what they did on screen. It was absolutely absurd and awful, but very funny. In any case, uh, I, when we were de de debating the script, f finally a friend of mine, Anil Tejani, the executive producer, a very good friend with scripts, he said, why don't we settle on a number that Chai Pao has to make in order to go home? And we settled on 500 rupees. And the idea really was that we would have a kind of scratch card of like how much money he was ma would have made and then how much he would lose if the glasses were broken and then how much, you know, the up and down of his accounts would be our narrative spine. And um, it's funny how one idea helps another idea, you know. And then that became the spine, like will he make money to go home? So when we were shooting the film at the end, there were so many options available to us. Should he go home? You know, should he attempt to get on a train? Should he, you know, what should he do? And of course, that question with the idea of also money, budget, time, and all those real things that happen when you're shooting a movie, um, finally whittled down to the simplest idea of him just being wasted alone with his top after killing a man. So life would not be, he would not be a boy anymore, you know? So that's what it happened. But the idea for me was that after we showed you this whole universe, the tapestry, especially the Ganpati ceremony and everything, every character having, going somewhere, we were finally left alone with the core of the film, which was Shafiq, which was Chaipao. So like that. So, you know, we never, it was exhausting to get that far. We never dreamt the next scene. <laughs> Yes. Uh, all the way in the back. Yeah. It's a question about how you describe the project to the children. Is that? What did, you mm -hmm. tell them what, what did I tell them was at what? stake, how did they and how did they respond? Um, 
you know, the kids loved movies. The, one of the big things we used to do, what they used to do, was to see movies. B Bollywood, you know, big commercial movies. A big part is life on the street is really hot and fatiguing and exhausting. And any time they would make money, they would go into an air-conditioned dark theater and sit and watch a movie again and again and again. Um, so number one, I told them that our movie was going to be nothing like those movies they saw, uh, in the sense that they w this movie was going to be about their real lives, you know. But I hope to make a movie that they would like to see in the same theaters. That is to say, a movie about their lives, but that they would like to see, that, you know. And um, and and slowly in the in the workshop, the question of acting became a bad word. You know, anything that struck, uh, that, that was like the movies they saw, that swagger, that kind of artificial, bigger than life thing that happens in a lot of our commercial movies was not going to be in this movie. So firstly, it was about trying to attune them to the fact that reality was really the key here, you know, their lives, you know. So I told them that I was gonna make a film, they were going to make a film, really, with me and us about, their life, you know, and their, what, what informed their life. And, the, and I didn't go into words. Kids don't, they don't need to be put, everything doesn't need to be put in, in sort of definitions for them. It was more a process of creating an enormous amount of trust and a, and a place that we would all come together to make fools of ourselves for eight weeks, to create an atmosphere where they, we could rely and, on each other. And, um, but a big impetus was to make them feel that this was their story and that they were going to correct me, as they did every day, uh, about, about the reality of it. It's a question about the intimacy between the male characters. Is that supposed to suggest homosexuality or just... It was not accidental. That is how life is, you know. B men are c commonly hold hands and walk together. It's not, they may b they, it's not necessarily that they are homosexual. It is not necessarily that they are, are or not, you know. A lot of it is also to do with uh, it being, now it's different. India is a bit different now. But then it's a, it's a pretty repressed culture with uh, dis display of uh, affection. We don't do that, you know, between man and woman. They're commonly on the streets and it's just not done. And so uh, a lot of times men are just in that, uh, it's completely common everywhere, you know, and it doesn't necessarily connote anything. So it was not accidental. It was just... That is how it is, you know. And some of it can be gay and some of it is not, you know. It's just the way life is. Yeah, very interesting always. We have life. time for a few more questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This viewer is asking about how Mira made even more successful films after this, okay. how it, that she was not a one-hit wonder. Then <laughs> My career wasn't over after Salam Bombay. Um, there's no secret, really. I think the secret, f the, the thing for me is that I continue to follow my instinct and I continue to be a sort of bullheaded person about what I believe in, you know. And um, I have a real chip on my shoulder about people possessing my talent or owning my ideas before there is an idea, you know. So I don't ever, uh, now it's a little different, but I didn't really get into development and this idea, that idea. My whole idea of, of making films is when I have an inspiration, I make the idea fully with the collaborators I have and then we find money for it so the money doesn't pollute the idea before the idea is fully born, you know. And that's pretty much my formula for living. I mean, I don't, I have a great pride about what I choose to do and as I become, uh, you know, as I've become a mother and a family person and, and have a very involved family life, it's a big choice when you make a film, you know, what you choose to put your time in and what you choose, that is in itself a decision of what you choose to take your time away from. So the film has to be worth that time, you know, of my, the other part of my life. And that by definition means that the films I do uh, are, have to be done by me, you know, have to be made. Uh, they, they don't let me go, basically. And uh, lo it's a big uh, anchoring for me when I'm offered movies um, that I ask myself first, can anybody else make this film? And if anybody else I can think of can make the film, then I let them make it because then it's not necessarily for me to make. And maybe that is a good thing because that's why you ask this question because then, you know, my work comes with a certain kind of sensibility that you can't find just anywhere perhaps, you know, maybe. But it's always hit and miss. You have no idea what will be successful and what will be not, not successful. But the point is that 
you ha you know it's obsessive and if you have to make it then you make it you know regardless of uh, there's a lovely saying in the bhagavad gita beware the fruits of action and although the fruits of action in movie making are in immensely seductive and very tempting and make you feel up and down all the time um um but still the journey to making it has to be worth it otherwise it's not it's, that is, that is the idea basically is is how we make the film or what it is that you're saying you know more than anything it's what it is that you're saying for me at least I think we have time for one more question. Uh, gentleman on the aisle. It's a question if Mira deliberately wants to focus on important issues in her films rather than using film as uh, escapism, just pure entertainment for for, for view. Well, everything in film is deliberate. Every single thing. I, uh, the joke is that I, you can even choose your actor's underwear. You know, that's everything is deliberate. So, yes, of course it's deliberate that... Uh, that I want to make a film about first an idea. It's not so much that I have a f uh, the idea. The issue is not the first thing. The characters or the, the what it inspired me about the street kids, which told me that there was definitely a film here that I could make or wanted to make, was the fact that they had no uh, self-pity. Whenever I saw a, a, a street kid, it was they were flamboyant. They were grabbing onto any vestige of childhood that they could be because they were going to be child children at any cost, even though they had no childhood, you know. And that flamboyance, that panache was so. Firstly, was what captivate, captivated me. Not that I was a minister of social welfare and I thought, oh, how sorry I am for these poor things, and I will write section 1013 and I will bring it to the minds of the people. No. That doesn't change a thing, you know. But it was more that if I could capture that that flamboyance, that resilience, that lifeism, you know, that I'm going to live it up, just whatever I do, you know, that was what the inspiring thing was. And then you find a story, and you find this way or whatever, you find your way to tell that. But you know, you have to uh, rivet people. You have to command their attention. You have to earn their attention, and you have to hopefully take them on a journey that is unpredictable, that will absorb them, that will make you laugh and cry and all those wonderful things we go to the movies for. Because first and foremost, I really knew this film would, uh, should be made for the kids in Bombay, the street kids. And the street kids have a, uh, you know, they see every movie. So they, they are not uh, the lowest common denominator at all. They have a real brain and they'll tell you what they like and don't like. So that, you know, so I was sharpened even by them. So, yes, I mean, I do, uh, don't make those pleasant Sunday afternoon movies very easily. You know, I don't, that's not what I, makes me in interested. But uh, I do get excited by things that make you see the world a little differently, you know, after you've seen the film. I do want to just absorb you completely. But I also definitely love a good laugh and, and love entertainment. And I love to make you cry and I love to, you know, just make you feel. I have to, I love that, you know, it's a real privilege to have cinema, uh, to know how to use cinema to do that. And I try to do it with all my team and I have a great team, many of whom are here tonight, um, who make that happen. And um, we've actually, I used this opportunity to say that we just last week finished our new film, uh, The Namesake, uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's beautiful novel that will be out in the fall. Um, and um, it's, it's, you know, an extension of the same uh, aspiration, you know, of, you know, making your blood go quicker and making you feel things uh, in, a, in a heightened way. Yeah. I'm sorry, that's all we have time for, but we can join us at the party. Thank you.